Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Thanks for joining us uh, on this discussion of, of deep fakes. Uh, my name is Jevin West. I'm the real Jevin West. Hopefully you'll, you'll believe me, but maybe you'll have to figure that out later on. Um, I am an associate professor in the information school at the University of Washington. Um, I am also the director of a new center we have at the university called the Center for an Informed Public where our mission is to resist strategic misinformation, promote an informed society, and strengthen democratic discourse. So in service of that, we have, we have four pillars, research, policy, education, and community engagement. And that's what we're here for. This Earlier this year, we engaged in a collaboration with the Defending Democracy team at Microsoft to develop a set of educational resources around this. And we released just a few hours ago uh, spot the deep fake quiz, which we encourage you to go visit. We'll provide information on that later. It was just released and, I, and I'm curious how everyone's gonna do on that. I played it and helped design it and I fail at it all, 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 many times already. But today we're gonna talk about the issue more broadly. Um, we're gonna talk about the elements of policy, journalism, and also technology, of course. And I want to mostly turn this over to my um, to my panelists, which I thank very much for, for doing this. But I want to first introduce the moderator for today, Laura Ellis, who's the head of technology forecasting at BBC, and she's going to lead this discussion today. But all I ask of all of you is to engage in the conversations with the panelists afterwards and to also just make this information available to others, to just let, know, let people know about this technology and hopefully reduce some of the negative effects that it can have. So with that, I want to turn it over to Laura Ellis, and thank you very much, Laura, for moderating our session today. Thank you so much, Jevin. It's really great to be here, and uh, welcome everybody. Just to add my welcome to that of Jevin, yeah, I'm speaking to you from South London, uh, a slightly cloudy evening here. Um, apologies for any aircraft going over. We're in the flight path, um, and I just wanted to welcome you all to this deep fakes and the U.S. election. 63 days out, I think we are. Um, and yes, a Brit, but I'm absolutely obsessed with American politics and all the democratic importance of the things that are, that are going on right at this moment. So. I'm delighted that we have with us today uh, three absolutely incredible panellists. We have Nina Schick, who's a political writer and broadcaster. We have Corin Faith, who's from Witness, which is an organisation that uses technology uh, and, um, and, and audio and video to um, support human rights. And we have Ashish Jaiman from Microsoft, who's going to be talking to us about a range of countermeasures um, that Microsoft are putting in place to help us in this strange disinformation universe in which we find ourselves. So we know deep fakes is a buzzword so, uh, and we know that it's out there and it's something that we're all talking about. But why are deep fakes important? I did a bit of an experiment when I was on holiday last week. Um, I was in a quiet cottage in Sussex and I was on Twitter every day checking what was happening in the news. And I saw, um, as many of you will, um, Trump uh, going up a staircase and, and, and slipping and having a little fall at the top and waving his arms around. I'm sure uh, most people will have seen that piece of video. And I had a little bet with myself as to how many minutes would pass before, as I scrolled through Twitter, somebody would um, would suggest that that piece of video was a fake. That piece of video was not real, it had been staged. And it will come as no surprise to any of you to, to hear that there was a very short interval between uh, that piece of video popping up on my feed and somebody saying, uh, it looks altered to me. That was the first comment I saw. Um, some people have said that deep fakes is the dog that hasn't yet barked. Um, it's a great quote. Uh, and, and what they mean by that, I guess, is that we talk about it a lot. Called shallow fakes, things that have been slowed down or editing, but have we really seen an impactful deep fake? In a sense, although some would argue that we have, some would argue that we haven't seen many, um, it's a dog that doesn't really need to bark. It's, uh, it's having a, a notice on your gate saying that there's a dog in there, really, that, that allows people to use that knowledge to manipulate the way we uh, view the media environment. And you will have seen again, going back to Donald Trump, um, how after the Planet Hollywood tape came out, it was just too early for him to claim at that point that it could have been faked. But he started to claim that several months later, that, you know, perhaps it could have been a fake. And we'll talk a little bit about how that impacts on the uh, political scene generally. So we're going to have three presentations from each of our panellists. We're going to start with Nina. Um, after that, we're going to have a panel discussion 
um, and then we'll have some audience questions. So please be thinking about the questions that you might wish to ask the panellists. Uh, and I'll now hand over with no further ado to Nina. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. And thank you, everyone, for being here today. Um, I've literally just written my book on deep fakes and the coming apocalypse. And what I want to start with is by contextualizing deep fakes as the latest evolving threat in what is a crisis of dis and misinformation. And dis and misinformation is a good starting point just to define what that means. And disinformation is obviously bad information that spread with the intent to deceive, whereas misinformation is just bad information that is passed around without necessarily any kind of attempt to deceive. Um, this has always existed since time immemorial, right? So a lot of people often say, well, what's the big deal? Disinformation, misinformation been around since time immemorial. Absolutely true. But as I argue in my book, what has happened in the age of information is that our information ecosystem has changed so rapidly. And of course, for the kind of first few years of the age of information, we assumed that this would be uh, a universal good for humanity. But now we're starting to see some of the darker sides of the age of misinformation to the extent where for the past kind of 10 years, we've been inundated with a crisis of bad information, both mis and disinformation, which we as society have been too slow to understand and also too slow to defend against. And it's against already this crisis of mis and disinformation that the next evolving threat in the in the form of deep fakes is coming and something which I believe we're completely unprepared for. So when it comes to why are the threats different this time, um, with the technology of the information age, even though the technology is really only an amplifier of human intention, what it is allowed to happen is for the manipulation of information to become far more potent. So if you look at old forms of disinformation, for example, um, some Soviet manipulation of photography, which was something that developed entire cottage industry under Stalin, for example, it took a lot of effort. You needed skilled craftsmen to kind of manipulate the visual record. But now that's something thanks to Photoshop and Instagram filters and now even apps on your phone, something that is accessible almost universally without any skill and it's become far more potent. And the other defining system, I think, the other defining factor of how our information ecosystem has changed is that this kind of manipulation can be shared universally to a global audience, right? Which is why we've been seeing such a crisis over the past 10 years. It's against this backdrop that the latest evolving threat of synthetic media is emerging. And I think it's very important to distinguish the taxonomy here because deep fakes and synthetic media are such a cutting edge new um new uh, are so are just emerging right now so they're still so cutting edge that it's important to distinguish that not all synthetic media will be used for bad so synthetic media will have many viable commercial applications and things like um, corporate communications, in videos and in movies, but essentially what it is, is a piece of media, so that can be video, audio, text, image, that is either partially or wholly generated by AI. And that is going to take basically the manipulation of media, which the barriers to entry have been being lowered um, for the past few decades in the age of information, it's going to take it one step further to the extent where even video, which is something that we still tend to see as incorruptible and true because the barrier to entry when it comes to manipulating video has usually been something that's only reserved for either a Hollywood studio or uh, an actor with a tremendous amount of resources like a state actor that is going to become accessible to everyone. So I think it's really important to distinguish between synthetic media and deep fake, which I define as synthetic media that's used as a piece of myth and disinformation. Because like I say, the, the future of all media production is synthetic and it's going to be ubiquitous. So we have to distinguish that there'll be positive and negative use cases. When it comes to deep fake, so the negative use of synthetic media, 
it has a very kind of tawdry uh, genesis. The genesis of deepfakes, uh, they've been around really for less than two and a half years, and they emerged on Reddit. Um, where one user, an anonymous, an anonymous man, we don't know who he is, but we know he's an anonymous guy who's interested in machine learning, calling himself deep fakes as a portmanteau of deep learning and fakes, started using some of the open source tools that were emerging out of the AI research community and discovered that he could use some of these open source research AI tools to create a new kind of fake video. And what he was doing was using it to create fake porn of celebrities. And on this Reddit thread, he shared his techniques, how he had done it. And the Reddit thread basically exploded and uh, loads of other interested Redditors started creating their own kind of deep fake porn videos of celebrities. Um, there's always been fake porn for as long as at least since Photoshop has been around, but these creations were absolutely different because you know they were celebrities who are live in film and their their faces were moving and they they were you know actually alive in this film and the thing i think was that when they started emerging on reddit i was advising um the former nato secretary general and i realized that even though the first application was in pornography in many ways pornography is so pioneering that this it wouldn't take much longer for this technology to be applied in many many other realms of life from geopolitics to politics but also being used as a tool against individuals and all businesses and indeed now that is starting to prove the case so deepfake pornography has only been around for about 2.5 years it's accelerating on the internet the first use case widespread use case of deepfakes that's really harmful is this non-consensual pornography but now we're starting to see it filtering out into politics and other realms of life as well so before i hand over to my colleague karen to talk about um his view on how deepfakes are potentially dangerous i would just wrap up by saying that this is a very sophisticated form of media manipulation that's coming at a time when our information ecosystem is already compromised and it's also coming at a time when video is one of the most important mediums of human communication uh, you only have to consider the, the one half of the world which isn't connected into this information ecosystem yet, which soon will be, who are still digitally illiterate and tend to trust the authenticity of video to consider the implications of what deepfakes can do, not only to politics, but to the perception of humanity, because it so alters um, the fundamental architecture of our information ecosystem and how we communicate. So this is something that I think is extremely important in the age of information, how the actual information infrastructure of our information ecosystem is being undermined and how we as a society have been really slow to respond to that threat because it's been evolving so quickly, we haven't been able to keep up. So I'm going to pass over to Corin now. Great. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot for that introduction, Nina. And it's really brought up a lot of the topics that I think are going to ground our conversation from from here on. Uh, the you know the evolution of the information ecosystem, and um, also particularly the the use of deepfakes as a pornographic technology, which is something that we really uh, you know we really can't forget in the way that we talk about it now. Um, so I'm going to talk about things from a slightly different perspective. Um, I'm from Witness, as Laura mentioned in, in the introduction, we're a global human rights nonprofit. Um, I'm the program coordinator of emerging threats and opportunities research. At the moment, I'm looking primarily at deepfakes and, uh, and digital misinformation. So when we're evaluating uh, deepfakes or any other technology in the way it affects vulnerable groups, um, at Witness we're basically asking one simple question, who stands to gain uh, and who stands to lose? And in the, so in the case of deepfakes I'm going to present some, uh, some of the answers, not definitive answers but some, some important answers. Um, in terms of who stands to, to gain, powerful figures who are resisting accountability. Um, 
why why phrase it like that? Why this particular group? Um, it's because of something that is called the, the liar's dividend. Um, this is a term coined by Danielle Citron. This is Danielle Citron on the screen here. Uh, Danielle Citron and Robert Chesney, two American legal scholars, um, they wrote a paper about deep fakes um, as, a, as a threat to democracy and society. And they coined this phrase, the liar's dividend, where basically they argued that even the existence of such a sophisticated deception technology already benefits people who are unscrupulous and who are inclined to lie. Because regardless of whether they use a deep fake or not, they can claim that any video or audio recording, whatever it is that holds them to account, is actually fake. And this is exactly what um, what Laura mentioned uh, in, in the beginning with a, a Trump example. I also wanted to point to a, another Trump example of the liar's dividend. Um, people here are probably uh, mostly familiar with the Access Hollywood tape that was released while he was uh, while he was still a presidential candidate. Um, initially, he was caught on tape saying all of these horrible misogynistic things about women, and he, he said, "Well, it's just locker room talk. You know, that's that's how it is." Not long after that, he started to say, well, actually, I don't know if the tape was real. There's ways that you can fake audio. So he kind of went back on his words and, and tried to hide behind this, this defense that it was fake, which is exactly how the lies dividend works. Um, so in light of that, who stands to lose? Now, I frame this in a very particular way, targeted groups without a large platform. Um, and I say that I say it like that because when we talk about deep fakes and elections, we're often thinking about very high profile targets. So someone might might uh, kind of conjecture, well, what happens if there's a deep fake of the president, uh, you know, ordering a military invasion or, or, or of somewhere or something like that? You know, what happens if there's a deep fake of, of Biden on the night before the election? Well, those things are all real threats, but people with large platforms are also better placed to correct the record. They have more of an ability to get ahead of the narrative, to debunk things, to connect with journalistic organizations, all of that. Groups who don't have this, this kind of platform are much more at risk. Um, so at, uh, at Witness, we've done a series of workshops all around the world on the threats people perceive from deepfakes. I'm just gonna very quickly run through a, a few of them. So. Firstly, we heard from a lot of groups, you know, poor communities, communities of color, sexual agenda minorities who already face state repression. They were concerned that deep fakes were already were going to be a tool benefiting the already powerful, um, whether those are powerful um, private individuals or representatives of the state, and they would enable them to just, uh, you know, exacerbate the repression they were facing. And if you look at you know, an obvious example here in the US, we've seen all of these Black Lives Matter protests across the country. We know that the police do not tell the truth when they're explaining how incidents, how violent incidents or even fatal incidents came about. Often it's only the presence of bystander video which confirms it. And the idea that they, these sorts of videos could be faked or manipulated and disregarded presents a clear threat to the people who already face uh, the, the, the most repression. Um, another point is that in the US, we are in a moment that is very, very polarized politically. Um, again, we've actually we've already seen examples of not the deep fakes, but this political violence. Um, we've had Kenosha and Wisconsin, one person shot. Also in Portland, another person shot. You know, the tensions are very high. So manipulated video that shows one group instigating violence against another, you know, real or fake, it doesn't matter. It really has to trigger. Uh, has the possibility to trigger real world consequences. The last thing, I almost have to apologize to Ashish as I, as I say this, um, people raise concerns that some of the detection techniques might be inaccessible to the groups who, who need them most. Um, we, we, you know, at Witness, we're not always working with groups that are, have high technical skill level. Certainly when we're working outside of the, the US, we're in countries that don't have as high a level of economic development. People are concerned that even if we have these algorithmic detection methods, they might not be accessible to the people who are most at risk. Um, but we're going to hear from Ashish what Microsoft is doing in this in this respect. And um, so I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, if you want more info about this, you can go to witness.org where you'll find all of the work that we do, or we have a direct link to the uh, synthetic media and deepfakes work uh, below that.
Um, and thanks with that, Ashish, over to you. Thanks a lot, Corin. Uh, thank you, great introduction, Nina. Thanks as well. Uh, I'm Ashish German. I am the technology lead on the Defending Democracy program at Microsoft. Uh, our main objective is to is to help uh, provide cybersecurity guidance to political campaigns, election authorities, and civil society. Uh, one of the pillars of our program is disinformation defense, and we have been focusing on the deep fake issue area under that uh, program. Uh, when we look at the deep fake issue area, we look uh, from a lens of policy, legislation, and technology. Uh, I, I'll focus on the technical perspective, as as Corinne Marina has actually laid the issue very well. Uh, so, I, I have five points that I want to actually get through for the audience. One is why are we talking about deep fakes now? And Nina actually did say that it, it is a very recent phenomena, but one of the reasons why it is uh, now all of a sudden capturing the imagination of everyone it is because of this perfect storm. Perfect storm of vast amount of data which is now available and we are creating, uh, in fact, uh, the World Economic Forum said by 2025, uh, we will be creating 463 exabytes of data. Just in the context of that would be 200 million DVDs per day. So that kind of data, and most of this data actually is in multimedia form. Uh, and for creating uh, AI uh, users, this data to learn and then create. So, and that's where the algorithms come in. Uh, there's a lot of work going on in the last couple of years on creation techniques. And the reason why businesses and researchers are getting excited about creation is because there's so many other positive use cases. Uh, accessibility is one, and, and we can talk about others as well. So researchers are getting very excited about the possibilities that that these deep learning algorithms can bring to market uh, to improve the lives of individuals as well as to, uh, to empower societies and, and institutions. And the last but not least is the computing power, the, the access to commodity computing, cheap commodity computing, or we all call cloud, uh, where you can rent by uh, hour or minute even, uh, and then do your compute. And all these three things actually are, are creating this perfect storm where AI now is becoming the normal course of discussion in any technical or even non-technical um, you know, <laughs> conversations. Uh, and then deepfake actually is, is one of the phenomena that has come out of that. This, so that's one big point. The second thing I want to talk about, just give you a reference is one of the mechanisms uh, defects are created is what we call GANs or generative adversarial network. So think about you know two neural networks or AI algorithms fighting against each other to create and detect and the, with a very simple aim that the detector should fail eventually. So the idea is that generator creates a fake image. There's a detector that classifies that image as real or fake using that knowledge generator would improve that fake image and that cycle goes on till the detector says hey i don't even know if it is fake or not that means that you know this ai algorithm which is trying to figure out if it is fake or not actually has failed the, the generator wins and the whole idea is like we are improving uh, the 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 fake image making it very very real now the challenge here is if if tomorrow we come up with a new detector, that detector actually can challenge the generator and 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 make classify the images that it has created as fake. Generator can use that knowledge and then start failing, fool the detector again. So the whole idea is detection is is possible, but it is super hard, and the generators actually can use that knowledge to improve themselves and create an even more realistic way. The third point I want to talk about is democratization of creation. So not only you have like I, you don't have to be a, a high tech machine learning AI developer to create a defect. There are applications, websites which you can just pay by like couple of dollars and you can upload and, and generate a good defect. I'm not saying a, a great, you know, 
fantastic, you know, Hollywood style deep fake. But for a couple of dollars, you can actually create a deep, good deep fake. Now, if you do additional work on that, maybe invest some more dollars, maybe hire an AI scientist, maybe use some other technologies, you can absolutely create a, a, a deep fake which is very, very real and very hard for humans to discern. So with that, I, I want to actually quickly talk about what are the technical countermeasures and also maybe plug in what, what we announced today. Uh, so one thing we talked about in core said detection. Uh, yes, there is, you know, I, I've tried to make that argument that detection is not only hard, but it is also a short term solution to this problem because a detector can be used by a generator to improve itself. Uh, the long term solutions as we in the industry, tech industry are thinking about as well as, you know, from inputs from civil society as well, is maybe there is a mechanism of authenticating the media. So think about, you know, on a browser, we have this padlock that sits next to the address bar, which is like, hey, uh, whatever goes on this medium uh, through the browser is actually secure. That gives that uh, perception as well as confidence to the user. I'm sure that you also have seen uh, the the security seals and other kind of uh, assurances uh, on websites. And the idea is taking similar concept and make something for video uh, for media. So if, if there was a technology that can prove who the author of this media is and then can track it back to that author, we may be able to trust that media more than the one which may not be uh, authenticated. Uh, similarly, if we can figure out where the original media came from and then compare any of the uh, manipulated media which had you this, this, this original media against it, there may be some level of assurance there as well. And if we package those signals together, uh, maybe we can actually solve this misinformation, disinformation problem in the longer term. But the challenge, again, is for these kind of technologies to work, you need industry collaboration. You need everyone from, from the technology, like creators of the technology, to the distributors of the technology, to the consumers of the technology, come together, understand what it is, and then use those signals to create an experience that the user actually uh, can make right kind of decisions. Either the tool makes the decisions or the user can make decisions and get some assurances. Uh, so all in the way of saying, that authentication and provenance, though may seem like a, a right solution, but will take time and a lot of coordination and collaboration. So, uh, so, so, so with with that, you know, I can say that technical countermeasures are not simple; they are complex. Uh, it, you know, and especially uh, with the development around uh, GANs and NAI, it becomes super, super complex for for having a, a, a valid technical countermeasure for for manipulated media. So when we talk about countermeasures, one of the things that that we feel very strongly about is media literacy. If consumers actually have can discern the media, have the tools to figure out if it is fake or not, uh, be a critical consumer of the media, that actually is the right way to solve a problem, not just technology. I'm not saying technology doesn't play a role. I think technology plays a role. I think uh, if we think that legislation plays a role, we also think platform policies play a role, you know, uh, how they do right kind of countermeasures, either label or remove the data, uh, remove the uh, manipulated media. And last but not least, uh, media literacy actually uh, helps uh, as well. Uh, and we have actually announced today uh, some of the some of the work that we have been doing. Microsoft has been doing both on the technical front, but also on the media literacy front. Uh, and we'll share the information uh, with the audience later. So I'll now go back to Laura. Thank you. I think um, one of the things that comes out so strongly from the, the the excellent presentations that all three of you made was how important it is for people to work together on this. Uh, she, she, you, you finished by saying that um, it was important to look at um, both the, the, the strict technology aspect of this and also um, the context of where this of, of, of where this particular piece of media that you might be suspicious about sits. And I know Corin and Nina, you've both touched on on how important that is to kind of make sure that um, people are aware of, of, of why they might be seeing what they're seeing. 
Um, I, I want to go back to that context, really, to start with as we as we go into this panel discussion. Um, so it seems to me that you, you can have an almost simple situation where there is a piece of media um, and it may or may not have been manipulated and it may or may not have been manipulated to a particular end. But um, I was reading Nina's excellent book last week and um, I came across uh, one of my favourite quotes, which is um, from uh, a Russian called Yuri Bezmanov who says that despite the abundance of information, um, no one is able uh, in, in this new world of ours to come to sensible conclusions in the interest of defending themselves, their families, their communities and their countries. Now, I mean, that sounds like an extraordinarily serious situation. Um, Nina, are we are we in that situation now? And, and if we are, with, with a view specifically to the election that's upcoming, what is the worst case scenario? This is a really interesting quote, which was uh, made in the 1980s by a former Soviet KGB officer who ended up defecting to the West. And he was describing the how Russian or Soviet at the time disinformation tactics works. And he essentially described how the aim is to completely paralyze or confuse your enemy or target by giving them so much information, an abundance of information, conflicting information, so that you don't know what information is in your is in your interest anymore. And the really interesting thing that I track in my book and um, with my kind of background in information warfare and, warfare and geopolitics, I start with Russia, who are really are the masters of disinformation, is that that kind of strategy which Bezmanov described in the 1980s has really come to characterize, I think, our entire information ecosystem itself. And we here in the Western democracies tend to be vulnerable in ways to external actors because of our liberal values, which, and I'm not saying suggesting at all that we should not hold these dear, our uh, commitment to freedom of information and access to information. However, the downside to this new information ecosystem that we've created is that there simply are no protections to bad information. So when it comes to the election, I mean, we don't even need to talk about deep fakes, you know, even before we get to deep fakes, we're already facing a crisis of information within our Western political systems. In my book, I not only talk about how that threat is coming from foreign actors, so Russia, China, increasingly uh, the rest of the kind of rogue and authoritarian nation states, who, by the way, because of the technology of the information age, have found it much easier to infiltrate our public discourse and our politics simply by infiltrating social media. So not only is the threat coming from abroad, but we have our own homegrown disinformation problems. And to a certain extent, you know, whether or not there will be Russian interference in the US election or Chinese interference, uh, which by the way is very important and is happening, is a moot point if the homegrown disinformation is something that we can't get a handle of. And particularly looking at the US and in the context again of this discussion with deep fakes, it's alarming to see how the president of the United States, who is not only the leader of arguably the most powerful country of the world, but also the leader of the free world, who is meant to be the man upholding these kind of liberal values, at a time when geopolitics is increasingly rocky and unstable, he himself is a keen advocate of disinformation and has keenly been passing around manipulated media. So it started kind of in 2018 with the kind of manipulated videos of Jim Acosta, the CNN correspondent, you know, where he was, it was made to look as though he had lashed out at an intern when he was questioning Trump in the White House similar pieces of manipulated content with Nancy Pelosi. And earlier this year, he actually tweeted his first deep fake. And this was a AI manipulated GIF of Joe Biden. It's quite silly, you know, he's made to look really sleazy and disgusting. Um, but this type of trend being set by the president of the United States and the leader of the free world is really, to my mind, uh, another is a very important symbol of how 
corroded our information ecosystem has become in the Western countries and how we are facing this crisis of disinformation and increasingly manipulated media is making its way to the fore. I would say for the US election, even though um, we are seeing manipulated media. I think the bigger risk for November is actually that authentic video comes out. This is something that Corin already mentioned, and then it is dismissed as a deep fake. Corin already mentioned how Trump did that with the 2016 video, which was the nadir of his campaign. And I wouldn't be surprised if something like that happens in 2020 again. So really what we're talking about is the erosion of any objective truth any reality or any factual basis to the extent that everything becomes polarized and everything is up for debate. And of course, for liberal Western democracy, which functions on the basis of an objective shared reality, that is an existential blow. So everything yeah. is yeah. to play for in this election. It isn't it just and I think you know that there's still quite a lot of disbelief when we see the sort of things that we are seeing shared and accepted and 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 argued about which which never would have been the case in in previous years. Corinne let's come to you because you have seen um, in the work that you do all this sort of thing at play in many other countries what can we learn from countries who've already gone through perhaps not in this in, in the actual sort of you know deep fake sense but in in the kind of um, information disorder sense similar experiences and similar elections? Um, I think the the honest answer to that is I, I think what we need to learn in a lot of cases is, is that we have to be better prepared than some of these other places and do a better job. Um, I mean Nina already uh, made the reference to Russia and the, the kind of like the Russian mastery of the art of disinformation, which the, the thing that we see is that Russia uses disinformation both in their foreign relations and also domestically. Um, and so in terms of this kind of um, what's been called information disorder existing within a disordered um, information ecosystem, Russia is much further along the line domestically in terms of being unable to to for a lot of people being able to uh, unable to tell what is real um, and what is fake. So I think Though we can, unfortunately, though we can talk a lot about what could and should be done, right now we have an administration that is in fact benefiting substantially from the way uh, the, the information ecosystem, the social media ecosystem, and also the news media ecosystem and the fragmentation of the news media ecosystem is, is benefiting Trump and the Trump administration. Um, until we see some kind of change there, Anything we really sit, say about how disinformation should be tackled at a, a kind of governmental level is just going to be academic. Um, I think that there's a lot that we can say about how social uh, social media platforms should be tackling it, and perhaps that's something we're going to get into later in the conversation. I, I don't know, um, but but you know, I think I can just preempt that a little bit by saying it seems like at the moment that's where at least some of the will is to make a change, although there's still a big question about. Um, how much will is really there. I, that, that's that's great. I, I would like to come on to the social platforms. In fact, that's going to be my next question after we've just been to Ashish to ask uh, a question. So so have your answers ready for, for, for what we're expecting the social platforms to do. But Ashish, before we do that, um, what's prompted you um, with Microsoft to come up with this suite of tools, if you like, to help people to detect disinformation? Because it's very clear, isn't it, that when we look at um, some of the users of social media that we see, there is very little willingness to, to want to sort of see and understand that something is false if it doesn't play to the narrative. And I hope there's also a lot of us out there who, who are very keen to sort of, you know, to look at something and to question it and to say, OK, well, is this true or is it not? But, but what is it that's prompted you to do this? Do you think there is an overwhelming need and how much are we going to have to convince people that there's something that this that these kind of tools are things that they should use yes yeah, so Lauren, let me actually take a step back and, and and tell you that we as technical technology platforms will not be able to change, solve the societal problems of being very excited by the falsity of information right we as humans have this innate nature to 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 get you know gossip and and and, and falsity and, and 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 other kind of things that that really excite us versus uh, what uh, 
the, so, so essentially the societal problem is is one side of it, but you know the eco chambers or you know the 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 bubbles that we live in is a real problem, and we should have some real social scientists actually look at the problem and try to come up with the right solutions. From a technology side, I can tell you that you know Microsoft thinks you know that that for every tool out there, right? The technology that we produce, the technology others produce, then our innovation, any innovation, in the history of it as well, you know, there are some positive use cases, but nefarious actors will use that technology to inflict harm, right? Individual or society, but the whole idea is that you know, when the technology is created, it is always created for right reasons, but then there will be actors who will actually use it to do bad things. So when we look at this technology uh, or the tools that we provide, our goal is to empower people, make it accessible and affordable and do good. Now, as we start looking into this challenge of, hey, we, we are the, the platform company that enables developers and creators to create something can that be used in, 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 in malicious ways? And this is what our, our learning has been for the last couple of months as, as I started looking into this, is that we anticipate, and, and again, you know, I think you, you started by saying like, uh, or at least one of the comments you made was, you know, folks are saying that, that it is a dog that hasn't barked yet. But I think uh, we have to, it's always better to be prepared. Right, even though, and and I I don't agree with that. It has not barked, but I I think that even even though uh, as a platform company, it is our responsibility to prepare for and pro provide right kind of technical countermeasures to an issue area that we can anticipate can do harm. And that was one of the reasons why we said, all right, you know, how do we look at the countermeasures? And I did share, you know, technology is one part of it, policy is another, media literacy as well, and maybe there is. There is a need for regulation as well, and I'm not talking about hard regulations curbing innovation, but meaningful, sensible in regulations around the misuse of technology. Uh, so going back to the, the core idea that when we looked into those countermeasures, what is our place? So we said we are a technical company, long term authentication and provenance word. So we started uh, uh, our researchers have actually put out some some technology out there. They wrote a paper and we thought it would be a good opportunity to implement that paper as a technical solution, which fortunately we are working with you or your organization, BBC, in trying to bring an authentication and provenance solution to market. Short term detection, the reason we actually went on the detection side is there is a need, Corin said, you know, the accessibility of this, this detector tools is a challenge for the people who really need it. So we're working with a partner to bring not only the detection technology that we have, but a, a, an us ensemble of other detection technologies into their tool set so that and then make it accessible to the users who really need it, like Corin and, 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 and the folks that he works with in the areas which actually typically are, are more impacted by this issue than, than the first world at this point. Uh, so that was one of, one of our reasons is what is a meaningful solution? And then the last thing I'll say is we also work with UW CIP to bring this uh, defect detection quiz, which also helps in media literacy. And that is not all. We actually would keep on doing uh, our role, a meaningful solution to this uh, space, uh, because at the end of the day, our mission is to empower everyone, but our program's mission is to defend democracy. Thank you. Um Let's move on to social media now, because um, I was intrigued to read that um, as Russia, who do seem to be the sort of virtuosos in this, were um, pulling together the Facebook groups, just for one example, that they were using to um, to put out information in advance of the last US election. Um, I think they had something like 460, was it, Nina, Facebook groups that they were using to disseminate this information, all of whom looked very um, much not as though they were just, you know, Russian backed Facebook groups. Uh, what should the social platforms be doing to combat this kind of disinformation threat? And, and are they? Well, the social media platforms absolutely have a responsibility to try and tackle some of the threats of mis and disinformation. The last decade, again, even before AI or deep fakes were a practical reality, we've already seen just how powerful disinformation on social media platforms 
can be, including to the extent where in some parts of the world, like in Burma, it actually Facebook was, you know, heavily used to incite a genocide against the Muslim ethnic minority Rohingya. So there is no doubt in my mind that the social media platforms have a responsibility um, because they are the gatekeepers of this new information ecosystem, which has become universal. You know, it's people even in parts of the world. I mean, I'm half Nepalese. People who don't have running water or electricity have an internet connection on Facebook. So there's absolutely no question that they have a responsibility. I would say that responsibility is firstly to use their resources to invest in some of the technical kind of solutions that Ashish has laid out. So the provenance and the detection tools, essential. Um, but then also work with policymakers to try and regulate the information space so it becomes a safer place. And finally, also invest heavily in things like digital and media literacy, because I think if we think the crisis of misinformation has been bad so far, uh, in the coming decade, as the tools become far more sophisticated with the evolution of deep fakes, and there are going to be more people coming into this information ecosystem, I think we are only just beginning to see the impacts of just how devastating this corroding information ecosystem really is. And it's a universal problem that is true not only to the citizens of the Western democratic societies, but to the citizens of the world. So the question of who controls the technology that has led to this architecture and the social media platforms are key amongst those is absolutely one that we have to get right. And it's something we need to debate because we need to talk about to what extent do we safeguard our rights? How do we balance our rights to free information and freedom of expression with security and privacy as well? It's something I think that needs to be um, a very important national debate in every country around the world. That's, that's Mind fascinating. Mind Sorry, I just add add of course. That, uh, just, just quickly. So um, yeah, just two points I'd like to make on that. Firstly, one of the things is that in terms of this question of what, what um, what can the social media platforms do? What should they do? Um, we've we've seen with coronavirus, it's really worth bearing in mind that they are able to act very fast when they need to. Now, there are drawbacks to that because we also saw that some groups that were um, publishing good kind of scientifically backed uh, information about coronavirus were, were removed. So, of course, it's, it's difficult to strike that balance. But they are capable to of, of moving very quickly. And they did that because they defined the pandemic as a very clear public health crisis, and it was therefore justifying of their, this this very um, decisive action. From that, we could argue that really we need to have a broader conception of the harms of misinformation because they are very very clear. Um, you know, harms to health, harms to people's psychological well-being, harms to people's physical well-being as well. Um, we've just seen. Uh, Pretty much across the board, certainly in Facebook and Twitter, they banned QAnon groups or Twitter has, uh, in fact, not completely banned. Twitter has deactivated many accounts. Facebook has removed a large number of groups. So again, it can be done, but it also needs to be done equally with a global perspective, because at the same time, we've seen in India, in fact, that these links have just been exposed between Facebook and the BJP, a very right wing a Hindu nationalist party, and that because of these close ties, a lot of anti-Muslim hate speech in India was going unmoderated. So it's really important that you know Facebook apply these uh, these kind of principles in a just global manner and not just for US audiences. Thank you. I was actually going to just ask a sort of a, 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 alongside um, that a question about um, to what extent we can enlist technology to help us with this. And um, Ashish, if you could do this one really briefly, I'm just very keen to get some audience questions in as well. But um, I noticed there was a report out about how YouTube had automatically deleted many, many videos over the course of um, some of the coronavirus uh, weeks where there were not many people in the office and then had to reinstate them because there were complaints, which seems to suggest that our, our algorithmic approach to perhaps you know taking down misinformation, and it might have been particular to the coronavirus crisis, you know, but it's not actually succeeding fully. So to what extent do you think we can use uh, technology, in some cases machine learning, to help us with this? Is it going to be useful? 
I'll say it, it is useful, but but it is challenging. And the reason it is challenging is, is some of the things that I talked earlier, uh, but the speed and scale the internet works, right? So, you know, how many videos, you know, millions of videos every day are, are uploaded on, on YouTube. Uh, now, there is a post verification and a pre verification, right? So if you do pre verification, uh, some of these platforms, the user experience may suffer, right? And, and again, the idea is like out of those millions, maybe 2% are bad, right? So so then, so the platform is making that decision that, hey, should we do a pre-verification? And then if you do the post one, then you have it out there and then you have to get a report to take an action. So there is this, this conflict or, or, you know, user experience versus business model conflict as well, you know, because, you know, what do you do as a platform? The other challenge that we have is the speed and scale of the internet and minor manipulations in a video can make the detector fail as well, right? You know, if the detector is looking for, let's say, a signature or a hash in a video, uh, a, a, a bad actor can figure it out, drop key frames, and all of a sudden the hash becomes invalid and the video passes through. So, so there are technical challenges to it. What I think is the best approach is algorithmic solutions with human intervention. Uh, yeah. If there is a, is a very close coordination, I think we can get there. Yeah, and I think the complexity is underlined by by the issues that we've had with the provenance project you mentioned earlier on and how complex that has been to, to roll out. OK, we've got some great questions that are coming in from the audience, and I'm going to ask Corinne the first one, which is, um, I'm quoting our questioner, I find myself still struggling with how to instruct my editors on how to cover a manipulated video without amplifying the messaging. Um, any tips on covering or language to use or avoid? Yeah, this is a really great, great question. I, I mean, I think the first thing that I will say in my answer is that actually there's a, an organization called First Draft News who really spe specialize in advising journalists on how to report on misinformation. And they have a lot of great resources on exactly this, more so than, than I can really say in, in a minute or two answer. Um, I think uh, I think a really important thing is is looking at the kind of threshold that justifies covering a story. So. Though it, there, there's no kind of hard and fast rule of where that threshold is, if something reaches a certain kind of level of, um, of amplification already, people will be searching for the term. They're going to find some kind of results. Those results might as well be a news story debunking it rather than the original video itself. At the same time, sometimes what happens is that kind of fringe rumors can start and they're reported because it, you know, it works for news. It's a little bit kooky. Um, people will click on the story and those kind of things can end up blowing something out of, out of proportion. Um, but, but I mean, general best practice is just to really lead with saying, uh, not describing the exact contents of the video because that can amplify it, but just saying, you know, fake, fake, uh, fake video targets, you know, Laura Ellis or something like that. Um, not give too much, too much detail, but just specifically say that something is, is fake. Um, or is repeat the claim before you describe the actual contents of the video or tweet or whatever it is, and then try and move on. But as I said, um, First Draft News is a really great resource for that. It is indeed, and I think, you know, so, so, so really good advice, and I think that tipping point thing is really important, and I've done some exercises with First Draft where you get to that point where you go, well, actually, this is so much out there now that, that we are going to have to report it, you know, versus are we going to amplify by the work we're doing? So yeah, really, really good advice there. Um, next question, not a, not, a, not a simple one, Nina, but I'm going to aim it at you anyway. How can we avoid the erosion of trust in institutions that is caused by deep fakes? Really, really tricky one. Well, I think that heart really, that question really gets to the crux of why the corroding information ecosystem is so dangerous, because you risk eroding trust in every public authority, in the institutions. And if you believe, like I do, that we want to live in a liberal democratic society where things like institutions matter, then the erosion of reality is an existential risk. It's, of course, a wonderful weapon and tool for uh, those in power who want to have an authoritarian state or authoritarian regime, which is why it's really worrying to see that even in the West, some political constituents have a vested interest in the information ecosystem being corroded and undermined. The only way that we can begin to deal with it, and this is really the reason why I wrote the book, is in the first instance, 
knowledge is power and understanding how the information ecosystem is corroding and just how pervasive that is, not only in geopolitics or in politics, but in every aspect of life, I think is the first step. Only when you begin to understand, can we begin to take measures to defend and fight back? And I think that a lot of the work on defense and fighting back is already beginning. There's incredible organizations like, uh, for example, Witness. Um, I, I talk about what Witness is doing in my book, um, like what Microsoft is doing as well. And you have to make this a society wide priority where you take a networked approach. So you cannot say, oh, well, it's just for the social media companies to sort out or, you know, some NGOs will work on it or Microsoft will develop the detection technology. It really has to be something that becomes one of the most important priorities for society and one which we really, I think the push has to come from almost the public because I don't know if it's necessarily going to come from policymakers. And the first step is understanding. Brilliant. Um, thank you for that. Uh, and thank you to everybody for questions. We've had quite a few of them coming in. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to wrap up now with uh, a comment from each of you, if that's OK, which I hope will address some of the questions that we've not been able to quite cover off, uh, but which have been very similar in theme. And they're around really trying to get um, the best advice we can. So for, for all those of us, all those of you who are concerned citizens, all those of us who are concerned observers of this, what is the best piece of advice you have as we move towards this election in terms of staying on top of this issue, keeping informed and protecting ourselves, our families and our communities? Uh, let's start with you, Ashish. Yeah, sure thing. So one thing uh, I can tell you, like we can start by, by just reiterating the fact that you know, defects can really alter the democratic discourse. Uh, false information, the, the trust decay that we were talking about. Uh, it may also have a profound impact on election outcome. We haven't seen it yet, uh, but you know, not in the first, like in, in on the Western world, but we have seen some examples of, of political issue, concerns and issues and, and harm essentially. Uh, even overthrow uh, a government in, in one case, trying to overthrow a government uh, in one case. Uh, the effective countermeasures, uh, as a citizen, I think I have to take my own responsibility. So, you know, as a voter, I have to make sure that I'm a critical consumer of media. That means that I'm not, you know, I, 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 I consume it, I understand it, I look at the context before I just go and and start sharing on, on closed or, or open social media too, no, because one thing that I can I can tell you is like we in, in the US actually talk about open social media groups where we, you know, there is a bigger concern of misinformation, disinformation, defects on closed social media groups like WhatsApp and, and others. Uh, so we have to just be a, a more careful, critical consumers of the media, take our own responsibility to make sure that we understand the context, we don't live in our eco chambers and, and filter bubbles, and, and, and then before sharing, let's just you know go and, 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 and be a responsible citizen and consumer of the media. Okay, thank you, Shish. Corin, you next. Um, yeah, I, I will be quick because I see that we don't have that much time left. Um, I'm gonna kind of come at this from a, from a um, well, from a, a slight tangent that I think that it is really important for individual media consumers to actually see themselves as part of the bigger eco uh, information ecosystem and think about what they can do to strengthen it. Something I, I would say, um, I'm from a journalistic background myself. I was a technology reporter before I worked at Witness. Journalism is unfortunately in a very dire state at the moment. And people might not realize how much that's true because we still see the big institutions like the New York Times, the BBC, you know, all of those kind of ones. Local journalism is in a really dire state. And so local media Media ecosystems are more uh, vulnerable to misinformation because the New York Times will probably be debunking rumors concerning, you know, Trump or Biden, but they won't be able to cover your local council member in, in you know, whatever small town you might live in. So for people to get get both kind of involved and follow local politics and also to support local media wherever they can is something that really has a, a net benefit overall. Good advice, thank you. Uh, and finally, Nina, what's your advice? So I would, again, just reiterate that although disinformation is nothing new and has really been around since time immemorial, what we're seeing now is unprecedented. We've never seen anything at this scale. 
um, our entire information ecosystem is at the risk of becoming very dangerous and untrustworthy. Um, I think that we need to make sure that society can almost keep up with the exponential technological changes of the age of information that have been, in the worst instance, an amplifier for this crisis of disinformation. And the way that we start is, number one, by understanding what is going on. So just putting this conceptual framework around how is AI assisted fake porn connected to uh, an attempted uh, coup d'etat in Gabon to uh, the you know massacre of Rohingya in Burma to the election in 2020, understanding that this is all being catalyzed and facilitated by the information ecosystem is the first step because only then can we begin to understand that what we need to do is shore up the information ecosystem itself. And uh, that comes through a whole measure of technical solutions, which Ashish covered, as well as societal and policy solutions, which is more what Karin discussed. And in the final chapter of my book, I put together a list of a whole host of organizations who are already working in this space, including journalists who need our support. So rather than getting sucked into the polarizing politics of the broken information ecosystem, the first thing we need to do is focus on fixing the infrastructure instead. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Well, everybody listening tonight has, has taken at least a step on that path by, by being here. It's been an incredibly informative discussion. Thank you so much to all the panellists who have been amazing. Uh, many apologies. I seem to have disappeared into the dark. Uh, I suppose to have the bathroom light on, but my husband's just switched off, so I'm not suffused in the glow. I'm sort of lurking in the corner. So many apologies for that. Um, thank you to everybody who have att who's attended this and who's, and who's been here and, and shared this with us. It's been brilliant to have you along and thank you for your questions. And thanks to all those who, who organised it and who, who laid this on. I think there is no more important thing to be discussing at the moment. Um, it's certainly given me a lot of food for thought um, and I'd just like to, to say a huge thank you. I know you'd like to join me in that um, before we, we head off for the morning, afternoon or evening wherever we are in the world. Thank you all and goodbye. <laughs>